Good morning. I had really hoped to film sort of a different introduction for today's video. I was thinking maybe of some outdoor shots of Christmas lights or maybe putting up decorations downtown. However, it's incredibly cold outside. The bigger problem is it's really windy. And so as a result, it would make the camera shake on the tripod and we'd just get a horrendous amount of wind noise through the microphone. So I guess you're just stuck with me and coffee today. I hope you're all doing really well and it's great to have you join us here for another video today. Today, I wanna to look at Advent because this Sunday starts the season of Advent that leads us up to Christmas. And so I want to look at the history and what the meaning behind Advent is. This is the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take seminary level education and make it available to everyone via the platform of YouTube. So we're breaking the four walls of the classroom wide open on the platform of YouTube. So if you like these videos and a good cup of coffee, be sure to subscribe hit the like button, give it a thumbs up, and share it with your friends. If I asked you what Advent meant and the history behind it, what would you say? Or for example, let's say you had a friend who was completely unfamiliar with Advent. How would you explain this season of the year to them? So let's tear this apart and let's dive into the season of Advent and look at it. The first thing we need to realize is Advent is the four weeks that lead up to Christmas. It's a season, a time of year that to a certain extent prepares us for Christmas, but it has a rather convoluted history behind it. Now, in order to understand what, the, what Advent is all about, we need to understand what the word means. And I've got to get my Latin Vulgate down here because this is where it all comes from. Now in Latin, Advent comes from two words, ad, a preposition, to or towards, and then venio, to come or to go. When you combine the two together, it means to approach or to arrive somewhere. In the Latin Vulgate, when this word Advent is used, it's used 27 times in the New Testament. And of those 27 times, it's rather interesting that four times it's used to refer to someone arriving somewhere. Like Paul talking about he's awaiting the arrival, the advent of Timothy to come visit him somewhere. It's used four times that way. Twice it talks about the birth of Jesus. But 21 times it's used to refer to the second coming or God's judgment at the end of history. So the overwhelming use within the Latin Vulgate is referring to the end of time or Jesus' second return. And this is important. The thing we need to realize is that the Latin Vulgate was the church's Bible for over a thousand years, from when Jerome translated it in the fourth century all the way down to the Reformation. This was the text that they read and they used in worship. In Matthew 24, verse 3, we actually have the use of Adventus here. And it says, Et quad sinum Adventus tui et consummation is seculi. The word that we're looking for there is Adventus, or return. And in the English, the translation reads there, And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that coming is Adventus, this return of Christ. And this brings up the conflict that we have in how we understand this season today. In English, we tend to understand the word Advent as a season to prepare for the birth of Christ. In the Latin Vulgate, and how it was primarily used up until the Reformation, it was used as a time to refer to the second coming of Jesus. So how does all this work out in the development of this season? Well, what we end up with are two trajectories for how we understand the season of Advent. They're in competition with each other. The first one is, is that Advent is a season where we prepare for the second coming of Christ, based upon how it's translated and used within the Latin Vulgate. The second trajectory is that Advent is a season to prepare for Jesus' birth. So we're preparing for Christmas. So let's take a look at how the two of these work out. 
and I want to dive into the first trajectory that's a season to prepare for Christ's second return first. Now it's difficult to pin down an exact date when Advent sort of as a season of prayer and fasting and repentance was first celebrated or observed by the church. But we have a sermon from St. Maximus, who was the bishop in turn, from around 450, entitled, In Adventu Domini, or In the Return or the Arrival of the Lord. And it's talking about Christ's second return and how we prepare for it. The second reference that we have is from Gregory of Tours, and he wrote sort of a historical book around 490 AD called Historica Francorum or the history of the French people. And he writes about how his bishop, Perpetuus, had instituted a three-day-a-week fast for seven weeks that ended on the last week in de December. And this was how Advent was to be observed, that we were to fast three days a week for seven weeks. And because this season of Advent was parallel to Lent, it was about 40 days long, and it went from the Feast of St. Martin's up until Epiphany, somewhere around the end of December or the very first week in January, depending on the church schedule you were looking at at that time. It was often called St. Martin's Lent as a result. Instead of calling it Advent, they called it St. Martin's Lent because it started at the Feast of St. Martin's. If we move on a little bit later, let's say 550 to 600 AD, we see at the Council of Macon in 582, and then we also have Gregory the Great writing that during the season of Advent, believers should fast three days a week. And they go so far as to say that they should fast on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Some of the monastic rules push this a little bit further, and they argue that all the clergy and the monks should fast every day during the season of Advent. Obviously, they thought that clergy were made of much sterner stuff than the rest of us. Or we could say that the theological Grinch definitely stole Christmas during this time of the year. These practices spread to England by the very latest around 600 AD. We have Bede, the great English historian, writing that King Lothair adopted these practices and said that all the British churches should fast three days a week during the season of Advent. Advent was a season of prayer, fasting, and repentance to prepare our hearts for the second coming of Christ. It was not primarily a season to prepare for the birth of Christ during this time. Now we need to throw the second trajectory into this mix, and that is Advent as a time to prepare for Christ's birth. What really sets these two trajectories in competition with each other is when they place the date of Christmas. There's two things we need to get out of the way real fast in regard to the dating of Christmas. The first one is, is that in regards to Christmas, we don't have any dating material in the New Testament that helps us precisely nail down when this happened. As opposed to, for example, his crucifixion, we know that occurs during the week of Passover. In fact, it occurs on the uh, Friday before Passover. So we can give a very definitive date as to when Jesus was crucified. We don't have any sort of historical markers or references to cross compare when he was born. The second idea is that the early church placed Christmas on December 25th as a way to compete with or to displace the Roman festival of Saturnalia. And that's just not well founded at all. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Their argument along these lines runs as follows. Because Saturnalia was already a religious festival that occurred between December 25th and December 27th, it allowed the Christians to observe it during that time. In other words, they would have had off the same time that the pagans had off during that period. So it would be easy to observe Christmas. The second argument that goes along with it is that as the church gained in power and status and was made a legal religion, they wanted to displace the festival of Saturnalia, and so Christmas took on prominence during that time. I don't think either of those hold weight. We actually have from the church fathers the reason why they moved it during that time. Now, why did they move it to December 25th? The first thing is we find no reference in the church fathers to Saturnalia. We don't find anything in their writings 
that talk about trying to displace Saturnalia. Rather, what we have is some very interesting sort of calendar mathematics that's based on an ancient worldview of how things took place. And so let's look at this ancient way of kind of dating things. As I said in the beginning, we have no reference in the Gospels as to when Jesus is born. So the question for the early church fathers became one of, well, we really don't have a great date to set this. And as a result, there was no observation date set firmly within the early church as to when they should observe or remember the birth of Jesus. The earliest references that we have is it looked like the churches in Egypt and some parts of North Africa observed Jesus' birth in the springtime, very close to the, the spring equinox. Why did the early church decide to celebrate the birth of Jesus in April? Well, this is based upon the way they saw prophecies or announcements like this being made. In order to understand this, we need to do a little bit of math to grasp their point here. Now, as I was saying, we don't have a firm date for Jesus' birth. No references to that in the New Testament. But we do know when his crucifixion took place. That was during Passover. And so they could count back using the Jewish calendars and see that this probably occurred on March 25th. Our earliest references from around 200 AD show that the church in North Africa, primarily in Egypt, celebrated the birth of Jesus around March or April, somewhere in there. And they did this because in Matthew 121, we have this prophecy where the angel speaks to Joseph and the angel says, and you shall call his name Jesus because he shall save the, his people from their sins. Now this ties in with sort of an early worldview about how prophecies or announcements or revelations like this were made. They often argued that for example, if you would have a prophecy that Caesar, somebody would ascend to the throne of Caesar, let's say this is given on March 1st, then 20 years later, that prophecy would be fulfilled on March 1st. In regard to this prophecy here with Matthew, they looked at that and they said, ah, so Jesus is going to save the world from the sin, his sins on March 25th. This is when he will be crucified. They argued that's when this prophecy to Joseph is made. They also then argue that because of that, this is the time when Jesus was born. And Clement of Alexandria remarks how the church in Alexandria observed Jesus' birth during this time of the year. Now Sextus Julius Africanus, now there's a name for you, pointed out the error in their mathematics at this time. He said that if the angel announces this on March 25th, that can't refer to Jesus' birth because if you read in the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph is then going to take Mary, he, they're going to go down to Jerusalem, and then they need to flee down to Egypt after that. So the math is off. What he does, though, is equally as interesting. He says, this is the date of Jesus' conception. So taking as conception, they knew how to date things, and so you count forward one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine months, and now we are in December, and this is when Jesus should have been born. And so somewhere between just December 25th and let's say January 6th is when the early church began to date the birth of Christ. And this occurs somewhere around 240, 250 AD. I have to move my mathematics off to the side here. Now, remember I said earlier, the popular view is that the church moved it to December 25th to compete or to replace Saturnalia. If you notice here, it has nothing at all to do with that. It concerns the church's attempt to arrive at sort of a dating for when Jesus is born. By around 350 to 400 AD, it really looks like December 25th is the date that the Latin speaking church really observes the birth of Jesus on. So now we have two things that are coming into competition during December. The first is the dating of Christmas itself, and the second thing is this Advent as a season of prayer, fasting, and repentance, and the two really don't fit well together. Advent is looking forward to the second return of Christ, and Christmas is celebrating his first. So how does the church resolve these two sort of competing theological tendencies 
within the liturgical year. Well, they really didn't resolve it. Instead, these two trajectories are held in tension with each other during the season of Advent. And I think holding these two different theological trajectories in tension is important because the Christian life is lived in what we call the already but not yet. We're already saved, but we're not yet in heaven. So how does this fit together in Advent? Well, it's a season where we look back and we remember Christ's birth in Bethlehem, and then we look forward to his second return and the consummation of the kingdom at the end of time. Advent reminds us of the historical tension that we live within. On the one hand, we look back at Jesus' birth in, in Bethlehem, but at the same time, we look forward to the consummation of his kingdom at the end of time. And so in a certain sense, Advent is a season that holds the tension of the already, but not yet in a very visible and dynamic way within the liturgical year. And the lectionary readings also show how this tension is laced together during this season. On the first Sunday of Advent, the main reading from the Old Testament and the Gospel readings focus upon the end of time, Christ's return, the consummation of God's kingdom, God's judgment of the world. It's all very eschatologically focused, which is what I was talking about in last week's video about Christ the King Sunday, how it helps set this up. And if you haven't seen that video, you need to go back and watch it. That's a really good one. However, I'm not going to go into detail about the readings for this Sunday in this video. It would just make the video way too long, 40 minutes long, and not many people would stick around. I would, but I'm kind of partial. And we can see this in this Sunday's readings where it reads from Isaiah 64 and then Mark chapter 13. Two texts that talk about this future when God will break forth in human history, wrap everything up, and exercise judgment upon the world. During the second and third Sundays of Advent, the lectionary readings from the Gospels focus upon the stories of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a figure who transitions us from this second coming or the great and terrible day of the Lord to the birth of Jesus. Because remember, John the Baptist preaches, he says, prepare the way of the Lord. And also because John the Baptist's story are very close to the beginning of the Gospels, it then moves us, lectionary-wise, very close to the readings about Jesus' birth during Christmas. John the Baptist's ministry then serves as a model for us to prepare our hearts for the arrival of Christ. And this way, he serves as this really nice transition figure from preparing our hearts for the second coming of Christ to preparing our hearts for celebrating or observing Jesus' first arrival when he was born in Bethlehem. And then finally, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Gospel readings are taken from Matthew's account where it looks at Joseph's story in the birth of Jesus, or from Luke's account where it focuses upon Mary's experience in the birth of Jesus. So what we have in Advent then is a season with two sort of theological trajectories in it. It's a time to prepare our hearts for Christ. On the one hand, in the first week of Advent, it's a time to prepare our hearts for the arrival of Christ at the end of time. By the time we get to the fourth week of Advent, it's a time to prepare our hearts to observe and remember the birth of Christ, his first arrival. And through the four weeks of Advent, we have this transition from the second coming to the first coming that takes place and we can see this in the lectionary readings and how we have this transition, especially the role that John the Baptist plays in this shift from the second to the first coming. What I'd like to know from you guys is as you go through the season of Advent and especially the lectionary readings during the Sundays of Advent, how do you see these readings preparing your heart for the arrival of Christ? I hope you've realized from this short video just how theology, history, tradition, culture, and the Bible all interact with each other to produce this very, very rich season, even down to the very text that we read during Advent. And also how this becomes a very, very important season of the year to help prepare us for the coming of Christ. And I'll let you decide which one that is. Until then, if you like this material and you find it useful, 
please be sure to tell your friends about it. Hit that share button and I'll send a link to them. Also subscribe so you know when I put new material out and give it a thumbs up or leave a comment down below. Until next week, peace. Thank you.